And finally, let's wrap up by generalizing the instantaneous acceleration vector, or simply acceleration vector, to 2D and 3D motion. So recall that acceleration vector is the derivative of the velocity vector with respect to time, so it is dv dt, and so far we have been restricted to motion along one direction, so it's been dvx dt carried by x hat. Of course, at this point, we know exactly what the generalization is going to look like. It's going to be dvx dt carried by x hat plus dvy dt carried by y hat. And if you're going to go 3D, the same thing, plus dvz dt along z hat. All right, so these are our vectors. And again, if you do not give me vz, um, vx, vy, vz, rather, I cannot compute these derivatives. So I, I have a definition, but it's not a very useful definition until I actually know what vx, vy, and vz are. Um, so we'll do an example in just a second, but let's just um, make a little comment here graphically. So this is going to, they're going to be similar drawings, of course. I'm just going to emphasize 2D and 3D separately, but you can't really draw in 3D on a tablet, so um, hard to show the difference. But let's remember that if you have a particle moving along a certain path and you compute the velocity, V of T, at some point, that velocity vector is tangent to the path followed by the particle. However, the acceleration vector is the rate of change of velocity. So it actually has no reason to be along v or opposite v. The only reason that was the case previously is that we could only move along the x-axis. So, okay, if you're, you know, velocity and acceleration could be in the same direction, both to the right, say, or in opposite directions, but kind of no other option other than the fact that we may not have any acceleration at all. But if there was acceleration, it had to lie in the positive x direction or in the negative x direction. Here, that's not the case in 2D. In 2D, you're going to find that the acceleration vector points somewhat inward. So with respect to the curve, the little piece of circle here, or circular arc, you're going to have an acceleration A of t, let's say like this. Now, whether it points toward the direction of motion or opposite, that dictates whether you speed up or slow down, but more on that when we talk about circular motion. For now, the point is just to emphasize that while you know that the velocity vector will always be tangent to the path followed by the particle, that's by definition, you cannot make the same claim for the acceleration vector. You don't really know offhand what it's going to look like. You can kind of guess you can kind of draw something reasonable, but you don't really know what it's going to look like. It's not as straightforward as drawing V of T. So V of T here would be along the path followed by the particle, and let's say that now we have an acceleration. It's going to point inward like this, maybe something like that anyway. Point being is that it has three components, and again, if you have vx, vy, vz, you know how to compute these components. So let's actually try and do that on an example, and let's start up where we left off with the position vector that we had been given before and the velocity vector that we derived from it. So we found that the velocity vector before was given by 2tx hat plus 7y hat plus 2t plus 3. That's just the previous video on instantaneous velocity. We were given the position vector r of t, and we took dr dt. We got v of t, and that's what came out. So to pick up where we left off, this is v of t. To get the acceleration vector, we're going to take the derivative with respect to time of each component one at a time. So 2t differentiates into 2 along x hat plus, well, 7's constant, so derivative is 0. So 0 y hat, or just you don't even write it, whichever. And then 2t plus 3 differentiates into 2 carried by z hat. 
and you can write this in a bit more of a condensed form, just like we mentioned previously, you could write AX is equal to 2, AY is equal to 0, and AZ is equal to 2. Right? That's more of a compact form for the components of the vector. Bit of a preference for me to do it that way, but it's totally fine to write it that way. Note, by the way, that all the components are constants. Right? So I did that on purpose because, remember, we discussed previously the acceleration vector and the fact that they could have components that depend on time, sure, but for the most part in this class, the components will be constants, making the acceleration vector a constant vector to begin with. So that's why I chose V of t the way I did in this case. But very simple, if you know V of t, you can take dV dt and get acceleration and get all three components, in this case, assuming it was a three-dimensional motion. Um, that the particle was undergoing. So that was, um, you know, hopefully a short but useful generalization of all these quantities. I think it's good to see once if you've never really done a lot of vector stuff and you haven't done physics before, to see how you just take something that worked in one dimension and really all you're doing is building it along the two other possible dimensions, the y direction and the z direction. And if you understand it and one direction or one dimension pretty well, it's, it's quite easy to generalize up to 2D and 3D. It gets a little tricky when you find magnitudes and all that because you have to use the Pythagorean theorem. More on that when we do problems, but it's, you know, it's, it's not that much more complicated to generalize these vectors and to just keep track of two or three components versus just one, um, which we have been doing so far. So not to suggest that we won't do one-dimensional motion at all, anymore. We will. But we're also going to move on to 2D motion in the next chapter, and so it'll be useful to have seen this at least. 3D you might do. It depends on your instructor, but for the most part in intro physics, that's a lot of, it's a lot of work, and the 3D stuff usually shows up when you do advanced mechanics or e &M or stuff like that, where you have no choice but to have the three dimensions. Anyway, that was just to generalize these definitions and talk about them in 2D and 3D. And we're going to now wrap up the kinematics chapter by talking about kinematics for circular motion. Thanks for watching this video. If you haven't heard of Cogverse Academy before, we're a tutoring company that specializes in creating course companions that help you save time and improve your grades. You tell us which class you're taking, and we'll have a look at your syllabus, old exams, the style of your instructor, and put together a course companion mapping over lecture notes, videos, practice problems with step-by-step -step solutions, even personalized study guides and access to a private chat for you to ask all your questions. If this sounds like something that might be helpful to you, feel free to check us out at congressacademy.com.